Okay, thank you. Um, so, so the first thing I'd like to say is that um, I'll be talking to you about group theory. Now, group theory is mathematics, but it's mathematics that is used all over the place in physics. So as you've heard, in particle physics, in string theory, in quantum field theory. So this certainly is a very important tool that I would recommend you, you take some time to master. Now, when you're learning new math, I think that one of the best ways to do that is to have a problem at the back of your mind that you want to solve. And the reason for that is when you're thinking about solving that problem, it may become clear that you need certain tools. So when you introduce new ingredients into your mathematics, it's not just coming out of nowhere. You've usually got some good motivation for introducing what you introduce. If you're able to motivate or at least understand why you're doing something, Usually that helps you to understand it better. That's the approach that I am going to try to take in these lectures. It's not the way that I learned it. And I hope that the examples that I've chosen don't look too contrived. And I hope there's enough of them that will actually guide you through the material. <coughs> okay. So I want to start off saying something a little bit about physics. Let's look at the standard model of particle physics. The standard model of particle physics is remarkably good. If you look in the introduction of, for example, Polchinski's two-volume work on string theory, Polchinski will tell you that the standard model has roughly 23 parameters. He will also tell you that, together with general relativity, um, we get a description which is consistent with everything that we can observe down to the scales probed by modern particle accelerators. Polchinski tells you that's roughly 10 to the minus 16 centimeters. Now, if you speak to the experts, they might, all ag they might not all agree on exactly how many free parameters the standard model has. They might not all agree on exactly how far you can probe physics down to what scale. But that's unimportant. What is important is that we've got a theory that is able to predict a surprisingly large amount of things with very little input. That's what's important. So this is a remarkable theory, and as a student entering into theoretical physics, it's certainly one of the things that you want to understand well. So let's start talking about the standard model, and let, let's try to explore some of the structure that the standard model has. Well, I guess on a very basic level, you could think that the standard model is giving you two pieces of information. The one piece of information, it tells you what particles you are likely to find in nature. The second piece of information that it gives you, it gives you rules according to which these particles will interact. Um, the answer to the first question, well, we know that there is a spin zero boson, the Higgs boson. It hasn't been detected yet, but we, we think it's there because it's needed to drive symmetry breaking. So there's excellent theoretical reasons to believe that there is a, a spin naught Higgs. We've also got spin one half particles, the quarks and the leptons. So, so the leptons are things like the electron, the muon, the tau, and then neutrinos. And the quarks you can use to build up um, mesons and baryons. You could then bind um, baryons to form nuclei and you could bind electrons to those nuclei to form atoms. So it's these spin one-half particles out of which all of the matter of the universe is built. And finally, we have some spin one particles, the photons, the W plus minus, the Z, and the gluons. And these are responsible for the forces that the, the particles experience. Um, so that's the particle content. What about the rules according to which the particles interact? Well, that's very simple. The bread and butter of the standard model are non-abelian gauge field theories. And it's really by requiring that our, our theory has certain symmetries that we land up getting the rules for our dynamics. <coughs> so the standard model tells us that there are electrons in nature. Any good theory must make a prediction which we can test in experiment. Perhaps the simplest prediction that you could make is you could say to an experimentalist, when you're doing your experiments, 
one of the particles that you should see is an electron. And you have to tell the experimentalist what to look for to see an electron. Well, we know from special relativity that um, there is a, a formula which says then which says E squared is equal to P dot P C squared plus the mass of the electron squared C to the four. So one of the things that you might tell your experimental colleague to do, you might say to him, when you detect this particle or when you see this particle, measure the energy of this particle and measure the momentum of this particle. If you plug it into this formula and you can then solve for this mass, if the mass is this value, you've just seen an electron. So this is one label we could have for an electron. But in fact, our experimental colleague is unhappy. Perhaps I'm all, I should say more correctly, he is more unhappy than usual. <laughs> and the reason why he is unhappy, he says, you did not tell me with which momentum the electron should be moving, how fast should it be going and in which direction. And the, these things, how fast the electron is going and in which direction it is going, is going to affect the value that we get for E and the value that we get for P. So how is it? I mean, E and P will change. What E should I use and what P should I use to get the mass of the electron? Well, that's the great thing about the label that we've chosen. It doesn't matter how fast the particle is going. It does not matter in which direction the particle is going. If you measure the energy of the electron and the momentum of the electron and you plug it into this formula, you will always get the mass of the electron when you solve it. That's an important idea. So this is a quantity which doesn't change for the electron, even if we change the direction in which it's moving and how fast it's going. You may ask yourself, are there other quantities that share the same property? And the answer is yes, there are. There are things like spin and charge. These would also be invariant. If I take an electron and I place it somewhere, I don't change its spin or its charge. If I point it in different directions, spin and charge doesn't change. If I boost it, spin and charge doesn't change. So these are good labels um, to use when you want to label a particle. So now you know what the good labels are, mass, spin, and charge. But being physicists, you can't possibly consider this to be a satisfactory um, state of affairs. You would like to understand why it is that the mass of the particle, the spin of the particle, and the charge of the particle are good labels for the particle. Um, and that's one of the questions which is going to motivate us. How could we figure out why mass is a good label, spin is a good label, and charge is a good label? And in fact, more than that, if we were ambitious, and being young, we are ambitious, we might want to work out a set of tools that would allow us to figure out what the good labels are in any situation. Okay, so how are we going to set this up? Well, one way of setting this up would be if we introduce some sort of a transformation. Let me call this T. So, so T is going to be a transformation, and what T might do, if an electron is moving in a certain direction and I apply the transformation, it might change the direction in which the electron is moving. Or if the electron is at rest and I apply T, it might change the electron so that now the electron has some finite velocity. So T is some sort of a transformation that could act on the electron. And the question about what is good labels, that would be observables that are invariant under these transformations. So I'm now going to have a nice mathematical way of, ans of asking the question, what are the good labels? There are going to be the things that are invariant under these transformations. So we'll denote the transformation by T, and we will have a label for this transformation, I. Now, I might be a discrete label, or it may be a continuous label. If I'm thinking about something like, say, a rotation, I may be an angle of that rotation. It might be the amount by which I must rotate. It may also include a specification of the axis about which I should rotate. So those would certainly be continuous labels. 
I might also like to consider three objects. And if I have three objects, well, then I can permute these three objects. How many independent permutations are there? A total of six. In that case, this index i would be a discrete label. So at the moment, I'm writing i. Remember, it may be continuous or discrete. Um, and one of the things that I would also like to define is some sort of a rule of composition, um, which I will write in this way, ti composed with tj. When I write that down, that's an instruction. The instruction says, first, apply this transformation to your particle. After you've applied that transformation, apply this transformation to your particle. So when I write down ti composed with tj, I first apply tj, and then I apply ti. Now, if you look at this, it may look unnatural. I mean, if you were going to read this, you would read i and then j. But remember that perhaps a better way to think about this is that this operator is being applied onto some type of a state. Okay, so maybe I'll write that as a ket. I've got some quantum mechanics in the back of my mind. And if I'm thinking like that, then it's quite clear that tj would be applied first and then ti. Okay. So now we are studying sets of transformations. <clears throat> I'd like to start off by writing down a couple of obvious properties that any set of transformations would have. Okay? So the first one is that let's say that um, I consider composing two transformations by this rule. So let's imagine I perform a translation and I follow that by a second translation. It's quite clear that the composition of the two is itself a translation. Okay? And that's not specific to translations. I could take a vector and rotate it. If I perform a second rotation, the, the net effect after I've composed those two is that I get back a rotation. So one of the things that I'm going to put down, and we'll write this down neatly just now in the form of a definition, is that if I compose two of these transformations, the result after composing two of them is itself a transformation. The next thing that I know for, for any transformation is that there's always the identity transformation. So if I've got translations, so I'm going to be translating this hand, the identity translation would be the translation that leaves the state invariant. So there is the state. I now translate by nothing. Okay, I just did it. That's the identity. It leaves the system unchanged. Everyone happy with that? Now let's think about rotations. So there's a rotation. I'm now going to perform the identity rotation, which means rotate by nothing. I just did it again. That's the identity. It left the system unchanged. So for any system of transformations that I might like to think about, um, there's always an identity transformation which leaves the system invariant. The other thing I know is if you give me a system and I change it in some way, well, I can always put it back the way that it was. So I could translate it, and then I could translate it back to where it was originally. I could rotate it, and then I could rotate it back to where it was originally. So if I compose those two transformations, I land up with the identity. What that's telling me is if I perform any transformation of my system, because I can always put the system back the way that it was, for every transformation, there must be an inverse. And now the last property that I'm going to use is that the composition of these transformations is associative. So let me show you what that says. It might not be obvious to you immediately why we are choosing this particular property as fundamental, but I'll explain that after we've written down the definition that we are driving towards. The property that um, composition, that, that these transformations compose associatively says that if we want to compose three transformations, so ti, tj, with tk, well, we could imagine doing this in many different orders. So for example, I could decide first to compose ti with tj, and, now, and then compose the result with tk. Another possibility would be to first compose tj with tk, and once I've done that composition, to compose that transformation with ti. Our statement of associativity of composition tells us that these two different ways of performing the composition are the same. 
Now, it's easy to check that this is true. Let, let's look at the case of translations. So imagine that we're going to perform three translations. So there are the three translations. On this side of the equation, I first compose the first two translations, which gives me that one. And then I compose it with the third. So I land up with that translation. Over here, I will perform the first translation and compose the second and third. Okay? And you can see that for the case of translations, at least, this equation is obviously true. And we'll see in a moment, why was it this particular property that we chose to extract? Okay, well, these four properties are what we're going to extract as the basic um, uh, properties of any set of transformations. Um, so we now make our first definition. Okay. So, definition. A set G is called a group if the following four axioms hold. So our first axiom is that we have um, we have a map from G times G to G, and this we call our composition law. And what we mean by this is, well, if we compose some transformation Ti with Tj, and Ti and Tj are both elements in G, then this composition will itself be an element in G. So that's the first property we're going to require. The second property um, is that there is an identity element in G. And by this, we mean that for this element, if I compose E with any composition T, this is equal to T composed with E, which is just T for all T in G. Um, now we want to put in our existence of an inverse. So for every T in G, um, there exists T to the minus 1, which is also in G, um, such that if we compose T with T to the minus 1, this is the same as composing T to the minus 1 with T, and we land up with the identity. And the last one is for any three elements of G, we can compose them and the composition is associated. Okay. So we have associativity of composition. So that is um, our definition of a group. And it's been motivated by what? By looking at sets of transformations. Mm. See, the nice thing about this is we've now abstracted some properties, and we might look for the most general objects that have those properties. Um, maybe that will take us beyond looking at a set of transformations. I'm always going to keep transformations in the back of my mind, and a little bit later it should become clear why I've done that. We'll, 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 we'll make it explicit. Um, okay. Now, the, the, the next definition that I will need, which I, I guess is rather straightforward. So, definition. Um, the number 
of elements in G is called the order of G. So if you count the number of elements in G, we'll have the order of G. Um, if we think about permutations of three objects, there are six different transformations we could contemplate. That group would have an order of six. If we think about translations, how many different translations could we perform? Well, a translation is labeled by the displacement through which you translate. How many different displacements are there? An infinite number. So the group of translations would be a group of infinite order. So the order need not be finite. And we'll have another definition that we will use. Um, if a subset S of G is itself a group, we call S a subgroup of G. Okay. The identity element is always a subgroup of G. G itself is also always a subgroup of G. If we are considering a subgroup which is not equal to G, we say that we have a proper subgroup. So those are just some definitions that we will use. Now, let's take a look at associativity of composition. I, I would just like to explain why it is that particular property we chose to abstract. Let's imagine that we would like to compose um, four elements of our group. So let's imagine that we have Ti. We would like to compose this with Tj, Dk, Dl. Now, when we think about composing these elements, there are many different orders in which we could perform the composition. We may first decide to compose Ti with Tj. Once we have done that, we may decide to compose this element with Tk. But we could have considered an absolutely different way of composing the elements. We could have started with Ti, Tj, Dk, Dl. We may have decided that we would first compose Tk with Tl. Um, then we would compose those two elements and finally compose it with Ti. And the question you might want to ask yourself is, well, in which order should you compose the elements? It turns out, thanks to associativity, the order in which you compose things doesn't matter. And let's see why that's the case. Well, um, let's start taking a look over here. You can see I've taken an element composed with an element. That's now composed with the third element. So I could, if I liked, I could start off by composing these two elements and composing the result with that element. Okay, so I'm thinking about that as a single element. So I compose elements one and two, take the result of doing that and compose it with three. I might also think that I want to compose one with the result of composing two and three. So that follows just by using associativity. But now, I might like to think that this is a single element of the group, which it is, and these are two other elements. So again, instead of composing one and two, I could rather compose one with the result of composing two and three. So this would also be equal to Ti composed with Tj, Tk, Tl. So we see explicitly that there's equality over there. So that's what the associativity axiom does for us. It doesn't matter in which order we decide to write down group elements. Um, it doesn't matter in which order we decide to compose group elements, we will always get the same result. Um, okay, now, one thing that we might like to do is the following. We said that we wanted to study um, a set of transformations. Um, from that, we abstracted a definition for what a group is. What we'd like to do now is we might like to focus on a specific set of transformations. Now, when you have a specific set of transformations at the back of your mind, you can often say, um, 
a lot more things, a lot more concrete things, because you've got some actual objects at the back of your mind. So we might want to refine this definition so that it is now no longer consistent with every single group of transformations, but it is only consistent with a particular group of transformations that we might like to consider. So how are we going to refine this definition? Well, if you, if you take a look at this axiom, for example, existence of an identity, quite clearly that can't be refined any further. You take a look at the set, you can leave it invariant. That means there is an identity element, and this is true no matter what set of transformations you would decide to consider. And so it is with, with this set, with, with this um, axiom, existence of an identity. If you transform a set, you can always put it back the way that it was. That's not specific to the set of transformations you're considering. And finally, the statement about associativity um, is also true for any set of transformations. So what is it that we can refine further? Well, it's the first axiom. We can say things that are a lot more detailed when we've got a specific set of transformations in mind. Because you see, that first axiom over there tells us that if we compose two elements of the group, we will get another element of the group but what we could say is, we could say, if you take this element and you take this element and you compose them, you will get that element. Now, when we start to say detailed things like that, we are saying things that well, is only true for a specific group. Okay? So let me give you an example of what I mean. And we're going to consider the simplest possible example that we could. We're going to consider two objects. So we will denote them by, um, maybe put it over here. We will denote them by dot and cross. And we will consider what types of transformations we could perform on these two objects. Well, one operation that we could have is the swap operation. So if we act on these two objects with some group element S, what it will do is swap the position of the dot and the cross. So we will now land up with cross dot. There is a second transformation we could perform, which is, any guesses what's the second transformation? The identity, right? So that will leave the set unchanged. Now, will this specific set of transformations, we can start asking ourselves, how do things compose? So if we take dot cross and we apply the swap operation, this will turn into cross dot. And if we now apply the swap operation again, this will turn into cross dot cross. So as a result, the dot cross was transformed to dot cross. So I write this down by saying that if I compose S with S, I get the identity. Now I'm saying something very specific about this group. I am refining the first axiom. Another thing that I could consider, so what other products could I have? I might want to consider the identity. And if I do that, well, the net effect is the identity. So the identity composes with the identity to give the identity. Um, I could also um, take a look at performing the identity and following that with the swap operation. The net effect is the swap. So I know that the identity composes with the swap to give me a swap. And finally, I could have started with the swap and then composed that with the identity. And the net effect of that is I get a swap. So the swap composes with the identity to give me a swap. OK. So this is much more detailed information than the first axiom. The first axiom just said, if you compose two group transformations, you'll get a group transformation. Here, I'm telling you, if you compose these two transformations, you will get that one. And we usually summarize this information in the form of a multiplication table. So what a multiplication table looks like is we list the elements, and the entries in the table are given by taking the row label and composing it with the column label. So E composes with E to give me E. E composes with S. 
to give me S, S composes with E, to give me S, and S composes with S, to give me E. That is a characterization of a specific group I'm looking at. So if you want to characterize a group perfectly, you would write down a multiplication table for the group. Now, notice one thing about this multiplication law. If I swap the order in which I write things down, the composition is unchanged. So if I wanted to compose a whole string of, of um, transformations, it wouldn't matter in which order I wrote that string down. I would always land up getting the same result. A group of that type is called abelian. So if a group is abelian, we have the following property. Um, we have the property that Ti composes with Tj to give us, uh, this is the same as composing Tj with Ti. Okay, and this is for all Ti and Tj in the set G. A group with that property is called abelian. Yes, Ishmael? It's true that S is its own inverse. That's true. Yes, that's true. Yep, that's true. Yes. Um, so this would now be a definition of an abelian group. A group which is not abelian is non-abelian. So it seems like we've now written down a specification of our group. However, now I'd like to show you something about that specification. Let's make a map. Let's say that um, S is equal to minus 1. Let's put the identity equal to 1. And for our group composition law, let's say that our composition law is just um, real number multiplication. Well, if I'm thinking like this, then if I take S times S, that's minus 1 times minus 1, which will give me 1. So indeed, I've got S times S is equal to the identity. I've also got S times the identity, minus 1 times 1 is minus 1, so S times the identity is S. I've also got 1 times minus 1 is minus 1, so the identity times S is S. And the identity times the identity is the identity. So if I make this identification... I've got an explicit realization of my multiplication table for my group. But I could think of a different realization. I could say, let's set S equal to naught, one, one, naught, and let's set E equal to one, naught, naught, one. And now if I take a look at my multiplication table, it is clear that E will compose with E to give me E. That's clear. This matrix times that one, well, that's the identity. That will give me S again. This matrix times that one, that will give me S again. And if I compose S with S, okay, I should say, sorry, our, our composition here is, of course, matrix multiplication. Um, <coughs> If I compose S with S, this is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. This is equal to 1, 0, 0, 1. So indeed, S composes with S to give me the identity. So I've got a second set of objects which satisfies the multiplication table. In fact, I, and, and I call these explicit realizations together with an explicit rule for this composition. I call these representations of the group. And there may be an infinite number of representations. Now, you can imagine, when I've got this explicit representation, there may be some relations that are true here for the S's and E's, but they're only true because I'm using this explicit representation. They might not be true for that representation. So it becomes important to distinguish statements which are true for a specific representation a specific realization of the group from those statements which are true and they use nothing more than the multiplication table. So they are true for the group 
itself. Yes, Jim. Um, okay, in actual fact, I will do that when we look at Katie's theorem. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I will look at that in detail. Um, so, so, so you see, now what happens is we've, we've got an infinite number of these representations and we want to distinguish between a specific representation where we might be able to make detailed statements that would not be true for the group as a whole. So what we will write from now on, we would write perhaps something like gamma tilde of s is equal to minus 1. And gamma tilde of e is equal to 1. Or gamma of s is equal to naught, 1, 1, naught. And gamma of e is equal to 1, naught, naught, 1. And the language that would go along with this is I would say this matrix represents the group element s in the representation gamma. The group element S is represented by minus 1 in the representation gamma tilde. Okay? So, so we've now got the idea, well, the multiplication table is, if you like, a fingerprint of the group. We can find many representations in terms of concrete objects that will provide us with um, a realization of that fingerprint. Um, but we want to distinguish between these concrete realizations from the extract group, group itself. What yes? Is gamma what is gamma tilde? It, okay, gamma tilde is the representation. Okay, so I would say I'm talking about um, representation gamma tilde. It's a map, and what it does is it, so for gamma tilde over here, if you plug in a group element, it will give you back a number which represents that group element. Does that answer your question? Okay, yes, Jim? Yes, please do. Think of the difference between Roman and uh, Arabic numbers. In Roman numbers, we write I, the letter I to represent the number one. We write two I to represent the number two. But for Latin, we write the number one to represent the idea of one, and the number two to represent the idea of two. This is exactly Yes. Um, so your representation maps between the, the group abstractly and the um, separated hash graph and some matrix. Yes. Um, how does the representation code for the way that you take um, representation your um, well, well, I would I would have to make a statement. What am I um, representing group composition as? Yeah. Um, so Well, you, you see, um, well, yes, I mean, the, the, the product is coded in there in, in, in a way because what you could think is um, I could take, if, if I've really got a, a, a representation of this group, right, we know that S dot S would be equal to E. So I know that if I take um, the object which represents S, and I compose this with the object that represents S, I must get the same thing as S composed with S, okay? On this side of the equation, the composition is happening at the level of the group. On this side of the equation, it's happening at the level of the representation. So you can impose that condition by the level of representation? This condition would have to be imposed if you were going to be getting that multiplication table out, yes. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay. Yes? Well, you must get back the multiplication table. <laughs> sure. Yep. Yep. As long as you get back the multiplication table. Yes, Jim. Yes, go ahead. Um, for this particular group, also use four by four matrices and place E for the four by four identity and for S to put the matrices that Robert has written in the off diagonal pieces. That's another representation. There are lots of ways to get representations. This is there too. I'm sorry? This is there too. Right. That's right. right. This is just it is there too. 
<laughs> yep. Okay. So. Um, <laughs> yes, Ishmael? Uh, what do you name a group that has this refinement? Uh, what's the name of Sorry, which has which refinement? Oh, oh you mean the first multiplication table? Yes. It's called Z2. In okay. <laughs> I, I, in America, right. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, good. So, w one of our tasks is going to be that um, we would like to give some structure um, to this problem. So every single group has an infinite number of representations. How do we order this infinite number of representations in a certain way? And to motivate the ordering that we are going to use, um, I would like to um, show you a couple of facts which, which really look almost obvious, but they'll play a key role in um, what follows. And it's the following. So let's imagine that we have a D by D matrix representation of our group. So each element of our group is represented by a D by D matrix. So perhaps now our set of matrices looks like gamma of T1, gamma of T2, and so on. One for each element of the group. And our group composition law can be written something like this. Gamma of T1 composes with gamma of T2 to give us gamma of T1, T2. Good. Now, <coughs> I want to take a matrix A. So, so, so this, is an, this is a D by D matrix representation. So what that means is each of these matrices, gamma, um, is a D by D matrix, and it's something else as well. The other thing when I'm talking about a matrix representation is that this composition law is always matrix multiplication. Now, what I would like to do, I would like to take a matrix A that is invertible. So, A is an invertible matrix. And I would like to um, use this matrix A to do a similarity transform. So what I can do is I can define a new set of elements, um, gamma of Ti. And gamma of Ti is given by taking A to the minus 1, multiplying that with gamma of Ti, and then multiplying that with A. Now. I've used the symbol gamma over here, which might lead you to suspect that this is also a representation. And in fact, this set of matrices over here do provide us with another representation of the group. Let's check that explicitly. Well, we take gamma tilde of T1 composed with gamma tilde of T2. Let's just write out what that is. So it's going to be an A to the minus 1 gamma of T1A a to the minus 1 gamma of T2, A. But A, A to the minus 1 is just going to give us the identity. So that will be replaced with the identity, in which case I have gamma of T1 multiplying gamma of T2. But gamma of T1 times gamma of T2, I know what that is, because gamma provides a representation of the group. So this is equal to A to the minus 1 gamma of T1, T2, A. And this is just gamma tilde of T1, T2. So as long as you had the, the correct composition law for, for gamma, gamma tilde immediately satisfies the correct composition law. Um, any two representations. So um, any two reps related by a map of the form star are called equivalent. When we make our list of representations, we will only 
include representations which are inequivalent. And the reason for that is, if you had the set of inequivalent representations, well, it's easy to figure out the set of invertible matrices and generate all of the other representations which are equivalent to the ref that you started with. So by focusing on just the equivalent representations, we've already narrowed our list down quite a bit. But we can do even better than that. Um, okay, uh, before we get there, sorry, I want to give you another definition, um, which I think is important. And this is something that's appearing a lot. So, yes? Okay, no. This is for, for any matrix representation of a group, I could do this. Okay? Just so long as A is an invertible matrix, this argument over here will carry through. And that line over there, that's the meat of the argument. Because it's telling you that if you've got the right composition law for gamma, you've immediately got the right composition law for gamma tilde. And that's what you need to have a representation. Okay, so I want to introduce another definition. So definition, if phi is a... Mapping of a group G onto a group G prime such that phi of T1 composed with phi of T2 is equal to phi of T1 composed with T2 um, for all elements of G um, we call phi a group homomorphism. Um, and we say G and G prime are homomorphic. Um, if the map is <coughs> one to one, we say G and G prime of isomorphic and we call phi an isomorphism. Okay, so that's an isomorphism. And we've got a special name for those elements of the group which map into the identity. We call the set of elements T, these are elements of G, such that phi of T is equal to E, the kernel of phi. And this concept will be used uh, quite a bit as well later. So those sets, those elements of G which map into the identity are called the kernel of phi. Okay. What is our definition of a group then? What are we doing? We are showing that a set of matrices is homomorphic to the group elements themselves. Okay? Because um, we, we have a map exactly of this form. The phi could be a gamma. That's the, the product for the abstract group. That's the product between the matrices. So in this language, our representation is nothing but a, a homomorphism. Okay, now let's consider our previous example, which is this example over here with these uh, matrices. So I'm working here again. I would like to consider an equivalent representation and I generate this equivalent representation 
by taking a, a is equal to 1 over the square root of 2, um, 1 minus 1, 1, 1. Okay? So I will leave it to you to do the, the um, matrix multiplications. Um, in fact, you can check that a to the minus 1 here is actually equal to a transpose. So that's a nice easy matrix to um, invert. So that's not what I mean by gamma 2 here. Um, my equivalent representation gamma tilde is given by taking a to the minus 1 gamma of ti I, A. I apply this map. What do I get for gamma tilde? I get the following. Gamma tilde of S is equal to minus 1 naught, naught, 1. And gamma tilde of E is equal to 1, naught, naught, 1. OK. Now, I want to take a look at the form of gamma tilde because it's got a very interesting property. In fact, gamma tilde is built out of two representations. So let me make that explicit. Um, so we can have one representation, which is the following. Um, gamma 1 of S is equal to 1. Gamma 1 of E is equal to 1. And our composition law is just multiplication between numbers. So if you take those two elements, you can verify that they satisfy the, the group multiplication table. Is this a homomorphism or an isomorphism? To be an isomorphism, what must the map be? One to one. Is that one to one? Nope. Both S and E are mapped to 1. So this is a homomorphism, right? Everyone happy with that? Um, this representation is, is that a homomorphism or an isomorphism? Come on, guys. Isomorphism. Why? Because S and E are mapped to different things. Okay, This is 1 to 1. S is mapped to minus 1, E is mapped to 1. That's a homomorphism because S is mapped to 1 and E is mapped to 1. Okay? In both of these cases, the multiplication uh, or the composition for the group is just multiplication among real numbers. Now, when you have a representation which is a homomorphism, We say that the rep is not faithful. Okay? And that makes sense, okay? Because this guy's got two partners. Well, that's not faithful. And over here, this rep is provided by an isomorphism. And here we say the rep is faithful. Okay? That's a faithful rep. That's not faithful. Now, our, our um, representation gamma tilde has got a very interesting structure. It's got the following structure. Um, tilde of s is equal to, now we've got a minus 1 there, but minus 1 is just gamma 2 of s. Naught, naught, and it's got a 1, which is gamma 1 of s. 
and gamma tilde of E is equal to gamma 2 of E naught naught gamma 1 of E. So these matrices look block diagonal. And what we've got appearing in corresponding blocks are the matrix from, matrices from a certain representation. And they're matrices from a different representation. In fact, in general, if we had one representation gamma for an arbitrary group, um, gamma 1, let's say, a second representation, gamma 2, and it could go on. We could have gamma 3, gamma 4, gamma 5, a whole lot of different reps. We can always form another representation by choosing to stick these on the diagonals and putting zeros off the diagonal so that we land up with a bunch of matrices that are block diagonal. And we don't even have to have this representation appearing only once. Maybe on this block we stick gamma 1 in again. And so it continues. If you were to multiply these, these matrices with each other, you would always be composing gamma 1s with gamma 1s, gamma 2s with gamma 2s, gamma 1s with gamma 1s. So you would inherit the correct uh, composition law from the representations that you have, and you would have built another representation. Any representation which you can put into a block diagonal form like this is called a reducible representation. So this is a reducible representation. It's not good enough that you can just put one generator or, or one element of the group into this form. You must be able to put every single element of the group into this form. When you can do that, we say that the representation is reducible. Now, take a look at our representations, gamma 1, gamma 2, which... Um, are there. Do you think I could block diagonalize gamma 1 and gamma 2? That would be tough, right? Because those are one by one matrices. And you can't put those into block diagonal form. So those cannot be reduced further. We would call gamma 1 and gamma 2 irreducible. Okay? We cannot build them out of some smaller building blocks in the way that we can build this representation out of smaller building blocks. So if a rep is not reducible, it's irreducible. Um, if a rep is not reducible, it's irreducible. Okay. Now, you can see that if we had the list of all um, irreducible representations, we could easily build all of the other representations just by putting these um, irreducible representations on the diagonal. So what our list is going to contain, our, um, we're going to just have basic building blocks. So when we say we want to list all of the representations of a group, our list will only contain the irreducible inequivalent representations because we can trivially get all other representations once we have the irreducible and equivalent representations. Now we might ask, well, how big is the list of irreducible and equivalent representations? It turns out that if we have a group of finite order, there are a finite number of inequivalent irreducible representations. So that's great. This is real progress. We've managed to give a lot of structure to this problem of um, finding all of the representations of the group. Seems like we're doing well. What we would, however, like to do, we'd like to have a nice, simple way to tell if a representation can be reduced. And we would also like to have a nice, simple way to tell if two representations are equivalent. So I'm going to look at the second question first. Let's try to figure out a nice tool which we can use to tell if two reps are equivalent or not. Okay? And we're going to start with a much simpler question. I mean, what is the general question? It means we've got two sets of matrices that both represent a multiplication table. And we want to know, can these two sets of matrices be related by some sort of a similarity transformation? I'm going to start off with a much simpler question. I'm just going to look at a single matrix. Um,
So. <clears throat> If I am given M1 and N1, how do I check if M1 is equal to A to the minus 1 N1A? Are there any suggestions? So I've got two matrices, you've given me these two. I want to figure out, are they related by a similarity transform? Well, the simplest thing I could do is the following. Note this. Let's say that I have a set of eigenvectors for matrix M1 with eigenvalues lambda i. Okay? So M1 has certain eigenvalues lambda i. If I take a look at N1 and I act on some kets I tilde and I will define I tilde by A to the minus 1I, let's see what I land up getting. So, in fact, uh, I want to, sorry, I put this backwards, I want N1 to have those eigenvalues. And now I'm going to look at what eigenvalues would M1 have. Well, if I now plug in my expression for M1, this is A to the minus 1, N1A. And I plug in my expression for I tilde, this is A to the minus 1, I. A times A to the minus 1 is just the identity matrix. When N1 acts on I, I will get back lambda I. So, those two give me the identity. N1 acting on I gives me lambda I. So, I just land up with lambda I. There's the A to the minus 1, which is left on I, which is lambda I, I tilde. Okay? So, what we notice, and this is the basic thing that doesn't change when we form a similarity transform, is that the eigenvalues of the matrix N1 are the same as the eigenvalues of the matrix M1. So if you want to tell if two matrices are related by a similarity transform, look at the eigenvalues of the matrix. If the matrices have the same eigenvalues, they are related by a similarity transform. But that's not really a good tool. It's difficult to find the eigenvalues of a matrix. So how can we make this tool more user-friendly? How can we turn it into a statement <coughs> It doesn't need us to calculate the eigenvalues. Well, note the following. Um, if N1 has eigenvalues lambda i, then N1 raised to the power of N would have eigenvalues lambda i to the power of N. Because every time I act with an N1 on this i, I get back an eigenvalue. When I've acted with all N of them, I will have the eigenvalue raised to the power of N. If I take the trace of N1, we know that that is just um, the sum from i is equal to 1 to d, the dimension of the matrix, of the eigenvalues. So the trace of N1 gives me the sum of the eigenvalues. The trace of N1 to the power of N gives me the sum of the eigenvalues to the power of N. So in other words, I don't have to bother calculating the eigenvalues. I could ask myself this. If the trace of n1 to the power of n is equal to the trace of m1 to the power of n for all n, then I'm in business. That would only be true if the eigenvalues of the two matrices are the same. That's an easy thing to do. We can raise a matrix to some power. We can take the trace. We can do that for both matrices. Here's a nice, simple way to test if two matrices are equivalent or not. Now let's take a tiny step closer to our group problem. Let's imagine that we've got two sets of matrices. The first set contains M1 and M2. And the second set contains N1 and N2. And what we want to test is the following. We would like to know is M1 equal to A to the minus 1 N1A and 
m2 equal to a to the minus 1, n2 a. So are those two sets of matrices related by similarity transform? Now, the first thing that you might say is easy. M1 is going to have the same eigenvalues as N1, and M2 will have the same eigenvalues as N2. So you might say, well, all that I have to check is, is trace of M1 to the power of N equal to the trace of N1 to the power of N. And second condition now is trace M2 to the power of N equal to the trace of N2 to the power of N. But that's not good enough. And the reason why that's not good enough is these equations would be true. This is also true if M1 is related by similarity transform to N1 and if M2 is related to similarity transform to N2, but a different similarity transform. Certainly these eigenvalues would still be equal to those. And these eigenvalues would be equal to those. We need to require something extra, which will tell us the similarity transform we're performing for N1 is the same as the similarity transformation we're performing here for N2. What is the extra condition? Well, let's call these two equations over here 1. And let's call these equations over here 2. And there is a difference between 1 and 2. If we look at 1 from 1, we know the following. If we take m1 times m2, this is equal to a to the minus 1, n1, a, a to the minus 1, n2, a. a onto a to the minus 1 is the identity. So we get a to the minus 1, n1, n2, a. So what we learn is if we perform the same similarity transform in M1 and M2, then the product M1, M2 is similar to N1, N2. That is not true for 2. If we look at 2, in this case M1, M2 would be equal to um, A to the minus 1, N1, A, A tilde to the minus 1, N2, A. And in fact, those two will not be equal to the identity. There is no obvious relationship between M1, M2 and N1, N2, which doesn't even appear on the side. So you can see that the, the new condition that we have to, to impose, this would certainly do it, if we take the trace of any string of matrices, and that is equal to the trace... of any string of the corresponding matrices, then we know that these two sets are related by similarity transform. Is everybody happy with that? That's the basic idea. Now let's apply that to groups. If I compose an arbitrary string of group elements, what will I get back? A group element, right? So if these were a whole bunch of matrices belonging to a group, this composition would itself be a group element. And if this was a whole bunch of matrices belonging to a group, this would also just reduce to a single group element. So if two groups are equivalent, if two reps, if two representations are equivalent, Okay, then we know that the trace of the matrix, the matrix representing a certain group element will be equal to the trace of the matrix representing the group element in the other representation. So if this is true, we say gamma and gamma tilde are equivalent. We introduce a name for this. Um, the trace of gamma Ti is called the character of 
group element T I in representation gamma. And we say that the condition that the two representations are equivalent is that they have the same character system. So if you calculate the characters for all of the group elements, they will be equal to the characters of the other representation. Yes, Noreen? Yep, that's what we're assuming. We, we, we're always assuming we'll, we've got a matrix red. Okay? Um, Jim, maybe you can help here. Okay. Oh, right. Good point. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, Noreen, okay, so, so Jim probably knows much more about this than I do, but I, um, I, I, the, the following statement is often made. Um, if you want to build a string field theory, what you want is you want a product that's associative. And it's really tough to find products that are associative. We don't know many examples of that. Um, one of the examples that we do know is matrix multiplication. That's certainly associative. And that's why matrix, matrices play such a big role in group theory. This is a natural way to build in the associativity uh, property. We now know of some others, like the Moyol star and things like that. It's um, an important fact that they're associative. OK. So we've now got um, the condition that two representations are equivalent. OK. Um, so, so what I would now like to do with the last few minutes of this lecture is summarize what we've done again, set things up for what we're going to do tomorrow, and then take any questions. So, so what did we do? We started off and we said we want to figure out what are good labels for a particle. Um, we then said that what a good label for a particle would be, it would be something that wouldn't change, for example, if we were to change the momentum of our particle. An electron could have any momentum. We wouldn't like to, to start making a mistake about whether a particle is an electron or not just because it had a certain momentum and not some other momentum. So we said, how can we find the set of labels that we could use to label our particle? Well, we introduced transformations. When we apply this transformation to our electron wave function, we, we may imagine that perhaps it would displace our electron or it may rotate our electron. And then our task was to find those set of labels which were invariant under the set of transformations. Notice I've not yet told you which set of transformations we could consider. Um, and we'll, we'll consider different sets and slowly zone in on the set of representations, which is useful. Um, we then abstracted four properties of any um, set of transformations. And we came up with our definition of a group, which is here. So there were four basic properties. Closure, under composition, there was an identity. There was an inverse and associativity of our composition law. Um, so, so that was our definition of the group. We then said, hang on, any set of transformations is consistent with this. What extra piece of information that can we give that would single out a particular group? Well, that piece of information we said was a multiplication table. And we found that when we wanted to find a set of objects which realize that multiplication table, there are many different set of objects together with composition rules that would realize that multiplication table. We wanted to distinguish between these explicit realizations, which may have special properties not shared by the abstract group itself. So we call these explicit representations of the abstract group representations of the group. We then wanted to know, well, how many representations are there? And we found that even if we just had a single representation, we could form an infinite number of equivalent representations. And we could also form an infinite number of representations which are reducible from that single um, representation. So what we've learned is, in general, there are an infinite number of representations. But if we focus, if we make a list, and on our list we only included representations which are inequivalent, so representations which cannot be related in that way, and representations which are irreducible, which means representations which cannot be block diagonal, then if our group has finite order, we would only have a finite number of these inequivalent irreducible building blocks appearing on that list. And then the last thing that we did today is we actually figured out um, a test to tell whether two representations would be equivalent or not. 
And we found that that was obtained by comparing the characters of the two representations, which are given just by taking the trace of the group elements. Tomorrow, what we're going to start off doing is we're going to start off asking how good our characterization of the group in terms of its multiplication table is. So maybe that's something for you to think about. Imagine you wanted to write down the multiplication table for the group of rotations or the group of translations. How far would you get? Okay? So, so that's perhaps something to think about for tomorrow's lecture. Are there any questions on what we did today? I have a question, yes. a suggestion for the students. Okay. Tell the students find the three-dimensional representation of the group that you've written here and ah. calculate its characters compared to the representation that you have. Okay. To find a three-dimensional representation of the group that we were looking at, calculate its characters, um, and see what you notice. Yeah. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. How would you be able to tell when you've got all of the reducible, irreducible representations? Ah, there? good question. So what we'll be able to do is, we'll actually be able to derive how many of them there are. Okay? So we'll be able to derive a formula which tells us exactly how many um, irreducible, inequivalent representations a finite group has. Okay, so that's one of the things that we'll be doing. Any other questions? Yes, Noreen. Can you actually question like the ratio and the matrix example that we need to show the trace of any product of the elements will be um, the same to the group and in the definition for lower you have the trace of two representations, whereas in this example, so you have one element. Is that uh, any for the product or just one element? Just one element. And what I'm using there is the fact that if I compose any two elements of the group, I'll get an element of the group. Okay? So there, I'm at two. Yes. So it must hold for every element in the group. So how many conditions would we need to check? G, the order of the group number of conditions. Trace of each element in the two reps would have to be equal. And that immediately implies that the traces of any string of elements would be equal. Okay, so that was a good question. Any other questions? Okay, then I guess it's time to break the key. <laughs>